thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning. I'd like to introduce Kevin Quinn, who is going to talk to us today about hiking the Cascade Mountains. Um, he has done some really nice programs in the past for us, starting with the Appalachian Trail, hiking the Appalachian Trail, the Camino de Santiago, and also the Ice Age Trail, um, when Sturgeon Bay became an official point in the Ice Age Trail recently. Um, videos of those talks are on our library YouTube channel, if anyone's interested. Um, so without more ado, Kevin, would you like to tell us about your hike? This is going to be about uh, hiking volcanoes. And I think a lot of people have kind of a dual reaction to volcanoes on the, on the one hand, and it's something we're fascinated by. It uh, can be a beautiful part of the wilderness, you know, snow-capped mountains can be iconic parts of the uh, identities of cities like Mount Rainier is for Seattle. And then on the other side, the flip side is the sort of the fear and apprehension that comes with the bad things that happen when uh, volcanoes can explode um, or erupt violently and cause a lot of damage and death. And so uh, we'll be exploring both aspects of that today. Uh, my experience comes from about 15 years of sort of annually coming out mostly to the Pacific Northwest to do climbing in the Cascade Mountain Range. And usually they were volcanoes, eventually climbing in areas of Central and South America. And it was all focused around uh, what's called the Ring of Fire, uh, which the Cascades are a part of. The, uh, the thing to re remember that I wanna get straight here is that for a lot of people, you talk about the Ring of Fire and they think of uh, a guy named Johnny Cash. It's not that Ring of Fire. Uh, it's uh, this Ring of Fire, which is a, uh, can everyone see uh, the, the picture I have on the right side? I, my, my video window is obscuring part of it. Yes, uh, we, but, we can see it, I think. Okay, perfect. It's, uh, so the Ring of Fire, is this arc of land that's around the Pacific Rim. And uh, it really, in a sense, is kind of volcano and earthquake central for the planet Earth. 75% uh, of the volcanoes, 90% of the world's earthquakes occur in this area. And the reason is thought to be related to the theory of plate tectonics. You know, the Earth's crust sits on top of a, an inner core that's more viscous. And these individual plates that make up the crust kind of move around and grind up into against each other. And when they grind up against each other, bad things can happen. Vol uh, volcanoes can erupt uh, and earthquakes can occur. And so it's, this is thought to be the reason why this area is so active volcanically and uh, because of earthquakes. My personal experience with this comes from the eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18th in 1980. So I, I grew up in Philadelphia, but in the mid seventies, I, I moved to Portland to go to graduate school. And on this particular Sunday, uh, I still remember this. I, I was in my apartment, uh, it was like 9.30 or 10 o'clock. So it was after the eruption had initially occurred and the phone rang and it was, it was my mom calling me from Philadelphia and she was asking me all these questions, you know, are you okay? What's going on? And I basically was just annoyed with her because she had woken me up. And I said, you know, everything's fine, mom. Why are you asking me these questions? And she paused and she said, you know, haven't you looked out the window yet? And so I went to the window and, and this is approximately the view I had from Southwest Portland. And I opened the blinds and the first thing I thought was that someone had set off a nuclear bomb in Seattle. At that point, you know, an hour and a half after this picture is taken, the mushroom cloud basically extended across the entire horizon. And it's still to this day, the most impressive natural scene I've ever witnessed. Um, and that was Mount St. Helens. So I thought it would be interesting to start off talking about other Notor notorious volcanic eruptions that occurred in the Ring of Fire, uh, Mount St. Helens being in that ring. 
Uh, the first one is, I think most people have heard about the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883. So this is the approximate area of it near Jakarta, you know, in the Indonesia. It's thought to be one of the most destructive volcanic events in recorded human history. And in, in my talk, I'm going to be comparing the energy that a volcano releases or geologists estimate with the energy released by an atomic bomb. And that's done in terms of, for atomic bombs, megatons. They equate an atomic bomb with how many million tons of TNT exploded is that equivalent to. So at just a level set, people, the largest atomic bomb ever detonated was one that the Soviets set off in 1961. They called it the Tsar Bomba. It was rated at 50 megatons or 50 million tons of TNT. Uh, I read that they originally intended to explode a 100 megaton bomb, but they were worried, the Soviets were worried that this might have planetary wide consequences that were negative, and so they cut it down to 50. Anyway, the Krakatoa eruption has been estimated at being 200 megatons of energy, or 13,000 times the, the energy released by the Hiroshima atom bomb. It was heard thousands of miles away, and over 35,000 people died as a result. And most of the deaths occurred because of giant tsunami tidal waves that were released throughout this area. So it wasn't the immediate explosion that caused the death, but the, uh, the sequence that was set off by the volcanic eruption. So it's it a big deal. And they made a really famous movie about this. Uh, so this is a blow up. Two thirds of the island disappeared. So this is was the island before the eruption. All that was left was this. They estimate that six cubic miles of rock and material disappeared as a result of the explosion. This area up here that's called Anak Krakatoa didn't actually reappear for decades. Uh, this reappeared as a result of lava from the, the core of the Krakatoa volcano. And so it eventually became its own island again, but it took a long time. And Anak Krakatoa means child of Krakatoa in Indonesia. The second one I wanted to talk about, a lot of other people, most people I think have not heard about. This was the eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815. You can see that it occurred also in the Indonesian area. There it is on the map and you know not that far from Krakatoa. So again, it's part of the ring of fire. This one was the largest ever in recorded human history. Uh, they estimate it to be four times larger than the explosion of uh, Krakatoa. So that makes it the equivalent of an 800 megaton nuclear bomb. Again, it was heard thousands of miles away. The uh, Mount Tambora prior to the eruption was this beautiful 14,000 foot high plus mountain. After the eruption, it was in an instant less than 10,000 feet in uh, elevation. Over 70,000 people died, again, mostly as a result of tsunamis that were released in the region. And it had planetary wide consequences. 1816 has been called the year without a summer because of the impact of Tambora's uh, explosion on the world's weather. There were crop failures and famines worldwide, including North America and Europe. So the other side of the planet was affected by this. So that leads to, I thought it'd be interesting to briefly talk about what the most dangerous aspects are of a volcanic eruption. The first one, you know, lava flow, that's one that most people are familiar with. The Kilauea volcano on the big island in Hawaii has been in the news the last couple of months because it's erupting again and there's a lot of lava flow. You know, the bad thing is that lava is going to burn through anything in its way. The good news is that you can get out of its way. It's moving relatively slowly, you know, one to 30 miles per hour. So you can avoid it, but you know, your house isn't going to avoid it. 
Um, tsunamis, we've talked about that repeatedly. That's a, a serious consequence of a volcanic eruption. And, um, you know, I think people remember in 2018, uh, Anak Krakatoa, you know, the same guy we just talked about, exploded, uh, a violent eruption, a lot of tsunamis in the area and caused a lot of devastation in, in Southeast Asia. Um, lahars are sort of upping the ante. These are, when a volcano erupts and it's snow and ice covered, water is generated, a lot of water that mixes with the ash and the rock and the pumice and everything else that's being generated by the volcanic eruption. And it turns into this slurry, this kind of the consistency of wet concrete. And it sweeps down the mountain at very fast speeds now, you know, 100 miles per hour or faster. So a lot more difficult to get out of the way. And it's going to cause destruction in its path wherever it's going. And it'll go wherever it wants to go. Ash fall is a problem. So I experienced this when I was living in Portland uh, in 1980. After the initial eruption, the prevailing wind uh, in that area is west to east. And so Yakima, Washington got hammered by the ash fall. And I remember the weathermen in Portland at the time saying, well, it's not going to be a problem for us if there's secondary eruptions because the prevailing wind is always west to east. Very rarely does it come north to south and Mount St. Helens is, sits north of Portland. So what happened, of course, was in June there were a series of secondary eruptions and the wind blew from north to south. And so Portland got hammered. This is a picture of downtown Portland uh, with ashfall. And, uh, you know, it's a pain in the rear end. Uh, it uh, wrecks internal combustion engines. It disrupts uh, passenger jet engine flights. So it was a, a real pain to be living through that. Um, the, the final danger is what's called a pyroclastic flow. So these are these super hot gases that get generated in the initial phase of a volcanic eruption. They move really fast, you know, in excess of 400 miles per hour or higher. Uh, they sweep down the mountain. This is the event that causes the instantaneous melting of the ice and snow that will lead to the lahar. So it's this sequence that causes the problems. And, you know, if you get caught in a pyroclastic flow, you know, you get incinerated uh, in an instant. Uh, and indeed, these pyroclastic flows are considered the most dangerous aspect of a, a volcanic eruption. So for, for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on the, what's called the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Uh, the Cascade Mountain Range uh, sits on the, the West Coast, uh, Washington, Oregon, and uh, parts of Northern California. So it's west of the Rockies. Uh, in terms of geologic age, it's a baby in terms of a mountain range. It's 2 million years old or less. You know, in contrast, the Rocky Mount, uh, the Appalachian Mountains uh, back east are 450 to 480 million years old. So and the Cascade Mountain Range has been around for the blink of an eye. And some of the higher peaks, the estimate is they've only been around for 100,000 years or less. I love this graphic. Uh, it shows the major mountains that have been the most active in this area of Washington, Oregon, and California. And then over here is uh, a graph that shows these little volcano icons. That's uh, an estimate of when a volcano actually erupted. And it's put on a time axis from 4,000 years ago to the present. So you can see that Mount St. Helens, for instance, is a very active volcano in geologic time. And 4,000 years in geologic time is not very long. Um, these are the five mountains that I'm gonna be talking about to specifically illustrate this issue between sort of the beauty that comes and the fun that comes with climbing them with the potential danger that uh, is caused by the fact that they're volcanoes and not dormant and could erupt and have erupted. This is a picture of Mount St. Helens uh, post-eruption. 
it used to be this beautiful mountain with this lovely dome at the top. And you can see with the explosion, it just blew out this side of it. And you can see here uh, the beginning of uh, a, a new volcanic uh, uh, lava dome that's being formed by you know, new lava flow extruding from the volcano. So by the numbers, uh, Mount St. Helens used to be almost 10,000 feet tall. Like Mount Tambora, it lost not over 4,000 feet, but it lost 1,400 feet in altitude as a result of the explosion. It had a, a series of uh, volcanic activity between 80 and 86 and 2004 and 2008. And uh, we'll be talking about this throughout the rest of the talk. The United States Geological Survey does a threat potential assessment for the volcanoes in the US. And they rate the threat from Mount St. Helens erupting again as quote, very high. So that's their, their highest rating. Um, I climbed it in 2008. So right at the end of its last most active period. And actually at the time when we got our climbing permit, uh, we had to check with the USGS because they were issuing sort of volcano forecasts and they would close the mountain if the, the threat of uh, a, another explosion or an eruption was too high. Uh, and we were fortunate that we happened to uh, climb it when it was pretty quiet, so it was fine. So this is just an, art, an artist representation of what the mountain used to look like. You know, it had this beautiful, lovely dome shape, and now it, it, it turned into this relatively sort of ugly scooped out bowl. So that's the view that I had when I climbed it in 2008 from the other side. So the, the scooped out portion is on the other side of the mountain. Uh, it had recovered some uh, snow and ice cover on its flanks. So th uh, the eruption of Mount St. Helens was estimated at being equivalent to a 2,400 megaton atomic bomb. So 1,600 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. It's uh, still considered the, the deadliest and most destructive volcanic event in US history. And uh, here's a number that I'll be using repeatedly throughout the rest of the talk to gauge the potential uh, danger of a volcano. They estimated that the pyroclastic release from Mount St. Helens released 46 billion gallons of water. Uh, at the time of the eruption. And this caused this sequence of events that led to the creation of this lahar, this vol, you know, wet concrete slurry that just cascaded down the mountain and caused all the damage. Um, 57 people died, a bunch of homes were destroyed, a lot of miles of, of highway and railroad uh, were destroyed. Uh, Far less loss of life than uh, with Krakatoa or Tambora. No tsunamis were associated with the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. So uh, Mount St. Helens as a climb uh, is considered completely non-technical. So you don't need crampons, ice axes, ropes, or anything. It's, it's uh, what's called a walk up. Uh, there's two different routes depending on the time of year you go. When we did it, the winter climbing route, which is this blue line, was the only one that was open. And so that's the way we went. We did it in two days because we liked taking our time and you know being out there as long as we could to enjoy it. Um, uh, you start off in the snow. That's uh, my friend Guy, who you're going to see on a couple of other climbs that I went with. Uh, he has the distinction of a now diminishing breed of climbers. Uh, he climbed Mount St. Helens in the 70s. And so he's been 1400 feet higher on the mountain than anyone else will ever, ever get because he was there before it exploded. So this is the approach that we took. You can see if you use your imagination, these are some climbers ahead of us on the climb. This kind of uh, snake-like line is a glissade chute, which I'll be talking about several more times. It's basically almost about the most fun you can have on a mountain climb because it's a, a sliding chute that you use to climb down, to get down the mountain after you've you know hiked up it. 
So we did it in two days. Uh, there's my friend Guy. So we, we, we camped partway up the mountain the first night. There's this expression uh, that people use, you know, there are old climbers, there are bold climbers, but there are very few old, bold climbers. Uh, we're definitely in the category of old climbers. And you can see that we're also very conservative because you can see here stacked by the tent. It's a non-technical route, but we brought our technical gear with us. There's rope, crampons, and ice axe because, you know, the rule is you never, you never know what the conditions are really going to be like. And you want to be prepared if bad things happen or if other people are unprepared and need your help. So that's day two. There's a guy ahead of me on the climb. Uh, this is a look down the slope. So it, it gets steep, but it's snow. And uh, that's me. Uh, always prefer to be climbing on snow. Uh, the snow was in really good condition. You can see that the crampons are strapped to my pack and I'm just walking up perfectly safe. What is not fun is climbing up a scree slope, which is what St. Helens turn, turns into later on. This is just pumice and rock and sand. And the process of climbing on scree, you know, is basically like climbing up a sand dune. It's two steps up and you slide a step down. It's, it's not a lot of fun, uh, much rather be on a snow slope. Uh, well, but we made it. There we are at the summit. And then uh, characteristic of climbing in the Cascades, uh, you can see here in the background, Mount, uh, Mount Adams, uh, you're up top and you can tell that you're in the ring of fire. You, you look one direction, you see volcanoes. You look another direction, there's Mount Rainier. This is a look out the side of the volcano that got blew apart. There's Spirit Lake and, and, there's, and there's Mount Rainier in the distance. So the ring of fire is a real thing. I mean, it's not just one volcano, it's a series of volcanoes. And you're constantly reminded of this when you get to the top of one of them. But then I'd mentioned before the glissade shoot. This is a very short video clip to indicate just how much fun this is to do. You just get on your butt, whoops. Use your ice Keep axe as kind of a steering and a brake. And you get down the mountain a lot faster than you get up. And then the other cool thing about being in the Mount St. Helens area is they have this area called Ape Cave. So it's a, a, an extinct lava tube that fed prior eruptions in Mount St. Helens. It's almost three miles long. It's the longest one they've discovered uh, in the US. And uh, you can hike through it. And so we did that while we were there. Uh, most of the time, you know, you need your headlamp on because it's completely dark. There are a few places where it's broken through to the surface. Uh, most of the time, you know, you're kind of scrambling around underneath. And then there's me, or, me getting near the end and then, you know, climbing out of it. Uh, if you ever get to this area, highly recommend visiting Ape Cave. It's really cool. Second uh, mountain wanted to, to talk about in the Cascade Volcanic Arc is Mount Adams. So it's over 12,000 feet tall. Uh, a much less recent volcanic eruption activity. They estimate that the last time was about 4,000 years ago. The threat potential by the USGS is about uh, is rated as high, not very high. Uh, I climbed it in 2006. Um, this is something that the United States Geological Survey publishes for all of the volcanoes. It's a a threat assessment map. So this area here is the area immediately affected should it erupt by lava flow and pyroclastic events. And these tentacles that you see coming out here in yellow and red are the potential paths for lahar events, these extremely destructive, fast moving volcanic mud activity. Um, uh, Mount Adams is only about 60 miles from Portland, a major metropolitan area, you know, almost 3 million people. So it, it definitely has the potential to impact the Portland area as did Mount St. Helens. And 
Yeah, there's the beginning of the Mount St. Helens hazard zone just uh, to the west of Mount Adams. And so, you know, Portland is kind of right there in the middle of the uh, volcanic arc in terms of potential danger. A lot of the assessment has to do with how much water could be released. Mount Adams has a lot of permanent snow and ice fields. Uh, uh, if you look up the Journal of Glaciology, they estimate 200 million cubic meters of ice. If you translate that to water releasable, 49 billion gallons of water, it, it erupted. So that's slightly more than the amount of water that was released in the Mount St. Helens eruption. And so it would be a significant lahar event if, this, if Mount Adams erupted again. This is the, the climbing route that I used. Uh, I did it with uh, my friend Guy and actually his brother, Gary. Uh, Mount Adams is another non-technical route. You don't need any technical equipment, although um, you know, on some of the upper parts, we were happy to, to have crampons on. We did it again as a two-day climb, just you know, because you know, we weren't trying to kill ourselves and we wanted to make it fun and last as long as we could. We camped out here at this area called the lunch counter at about 9,300 feet. It's this broad, flat area, you know, on the shoulder of the mountain. Uh, and uh, I'll mention again here, at near the top here is Piker's Peak. That's called actually the False Summit, and then the True Summit is up here at over 12,000 feet. So that's Guy and Gary. Uh, Gary is hanging our food bags on a bear pole because bears have been known to visit the campground here at the base and in the Cascades and you don't want them visiting you looking for a snack from your food bag in your tent in the middle of the night. Uh, climbing volcanoes, you want to get what is called an alpine start. That it's safest to climb when it's nice and cold and the snow and the ice is uh, consolidated. And so we always got started before daybreak. And that's uh, Gary getting his gear ready to, to go before we uh, start walking on day one. There we're approaching Mount Adams. And you can see why this is the false summit. And you can see why it's called the false summit. From this angle, that looks like it's the peak. That's actually the high point. That's 700 feet higher than this. From this angle, you'd never believe that in a million years. Uh, again, another view, false summit, true summit. Uh, and you can begin, you can see the path here. That's This is the climbing path in. There I'm uh, taking a, a rest break partway up. Uh, there's Mount Hood, another mountain we'll talk about, another part of the uh, Cascade Volcanic Arc. Uh, there we're approaching the Crescent Glacier, which is the first sort of climbing feature, if you want to call it that. We're uh, huffing our huffing our way up the uh, Crescent Glacier, uh, another volcanic cascade mountain in the background. And this is the lunch counter, this broad shoulder where we camp. Mount Adams is a very popular climb. You can see a lot of these sort of permanent flat areas that are perfect for pitching a tent. Uh, previous climbers have built these rock windshields uh, so it's uh, a well-established camping area. You can see across the snowfield here, <coughs> another set of uh, climbers that were there at the same time that had their tents pitched there. So this is the end of day one. That's a view from the lunch counter where our campsite was. You can see some tents there. This is the false summit. So at this point, you can't even see the true summit. And you'd think, unless you knew better, that that's your objective is to get up to get up here. Uh, and you'd be wrong because you get up there and you still have 700 more vertical feet to climb. There's Guy and Gary uh, walking their way up. So that's this is the lunch counter area down here. Uh, and that's a, a view from the false summit. You kind of have to use your imagination, but it, there's a series of three mountains uh, south of Mount Adams here that you can see, Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, and then the three sisters all in kind of the, the background here stretching away on the horizon. 
So now you can see the true summit. That's the objective. There's part of the climbing path. Unfortunately, again, there's going to be part of the climb is on scree. Uh, there's Gary way, making his way up to scree slope. <coughs> and there I'm striking the climber's pose on on top of what is a uh, was a active fire outlook shelter. So they used to in many years ago have a, a uh, fire warden stationed here year round to be looking for the possibility of forest fires you know in the Cascade Mountains and so they just staff someone up here to keep an eye. It's obviously abandoned now and you can see heavy snowfall is mostly covering uh, the, the shelter. So from the summit of Mount Adams uh, you can see Mount Rainier here in the in the background. Uh, and then you get back down to the false summit. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious what these guys are probably doing. Uh, but the thing that makes Adams uh, probably the most popular is its glissade chute from the false summit down to the lunch counter. At the time that we did it, so many people had come through and glissaded down that this was the equivalent of like an Olympic bobsled run. You climb down into the chute to go sliding down and you're about at the shoulder level with the, uh, the snow field on, on either side here. It was, you know, tremendous fun. So that's Mount Adams. So next one up that I thought would be important to talk about is Mount Rainier. This is a, this is a special one uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's over 14,000 feet high. So it's, uh, this is being the high point in the lower 48 to Mount Whitney in California by a few tens of feet. Um, it has a relatively recent eruption history. So late 19th century. Uh, and the uh, United States Geological Survey rates it as a very high threat potential. So it's considered uh, a very uh, dangerous mountain. Uh, I climbed it in 2007. Uh, and just beyond the US, it's considered one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. And uh, I'll get into that shortly as to why. So closest metropolitan areas are Seattle and Tacoma. A lot of people there. This is that uh, US Geological Survey threat map. So the green area is the area that uh, would be affected by uh, uh, volcanic lava and pyroclastic flow. And then these giant yellow tendrils are the potential lahar paths that would be released if Mount Rainier erupted. And you can see that, you know, there's Seattle and there's Tacoma, and then there are all these towns in between that are right smack in the middle of uh, these lahar paths. So potential for enormous destruction. And why is that? Because Rainier has a lot of glacier ice on its slopes. Um, whereas Mount Adams is estimated to have about 10 square miles of glacier ice, Mount Rainier has over 35 square miles of permanent uh, glacier ice. Uh, if you do the calculations, 156 billion cubic feet of ice that translates into over 1 trillion gallons of water. <laughs> so this means that there's the potential for a Lahar event that would be 23 times the size of the Lahar event that occurred on Mount St. Helens. So, you know, a huge problem potentially if Mount Rainier erupted again. And they take it very seriously when you're in the Seattle area you see these signs, uh, you know, warning you to get the higher ground if the siren goes off, meaning that Mount Rainier is going to erupt. And uh, they take this seriously and they post these signs because Mount Rainier is not dormant. It's clearly in some subsidiary stage of being an active volcano. I uh, climbed it using what's called the Emmons Glacier route. So it's considered one of the least technical routes on Mount Rainier, but it's still a, a 
technical route. You need an ice axe, you need crampons, you need to be roped up. There's significant technical risk from both avalanches and uh, falling into crevasses. So it's a mountain you need to take seriously. I did this as part of a guided climb. I didn't climb this on my own. You start off in this beautiful old growth forest the, on the Glacier Basin Trail. There were eight clients and three guides on the climb. Two of the other climbers were, again, my friend uh, Guy and his brother Gary. So the three of us were three of the eight clients. We stopped at the Glacier Basin Campground on day one. This was a four day climb as opposed to the two day climbs I described previously. And you can see here the, <coughs> in the background, the beginning of the more technical aspects of the climb up. We're getting close to that. The first technical aspect is the interglacier. And again, you know, sort of a, an advanced warning, these are glissade chutes because the interglacier doesn't have crevasses on it. So it's safe to glissade on it. You, you never want to glissade on a glacier that has crevasse fields because you could end up you know, at the bottom of a crevasse by sliding into it. So important safety tip there. So day one, we camped on the interglacier. You can see the group there. Uh, notice this algae, pink stuff, this algae that's turning the glacier pink. I've read that this is increasingly common and people have linked it to uh, climate change that previously apparently you didn't see this on glaciers nearly as much. So here we are climbing up uh, the interglacier and although it's uh, perfectly safe you can see here now that partly for practice we're in using technical gear wearing helmets on a rope team uh, in crampons. This is partially for practice and a typical rope team is going to be three or four people max. And the idea is if someone gets in trouble, slips and falls, starts sliding or falls into a crevasse, the other two or three people on the rope team, if they know what they're doing, can uh, uh, rescue the person. And so it was good practice at this stage uh, to be uh, using rope techniques. So I. I thought it would be interesting to show again a very brief video clip of of what it's like uh, to climb up on, as part of a rope team. The air is thin and it's hard work, and so you're going a lot slower than uh, you might think. <sighs> a lot of puffing and puffing, and you're not moving real fast, and you have a long way to go. <sighs> But you eventually get to what's called uh, Camp Sherman, which is about 9,500 feet on the mountain. So in other words, at this point, you have 5,000 feet of vertical climbing left. Uh, there's a permanently staffed ranger hut because Mount Rainier is a super popular climb. And uh, he's there to kind of manage the crowd at Camp Sherman and make sure everyone is, well, that they all have climbing permits and that they're all doing things properly and safely. Uh, and so, you know, you're on a slope and you have to camp. This is uh, day two. And uh, preparing a, a camp is hard work as well. So another brief video clip of what it takes. You need to level out a platform to pitch your tent. And uh, it can be hard work. <laughs> We found you could do this for about five minutes and then a couple of other members of the team had to step in and continue shoveling until you had a nice flat platform to pitch your tent. This is looking out on the more serious aspect of a climb. You know, beyond this area here, you don't want to venture unless you're roped up because these are crevasses in the Emmons Glacier that can be either a few feet deep or hundreds of feet deep, and you don't want to find out by falling into them. 
this is a, what would be called a snow bridge. So there are places where there's a crevasse that might be pretty wide and there's snow that bridges the crevasse you can walk across. You just want to make sure that it's a big enough snow bridge and thick enough so that it doesn't collapse and you fall in. That's why you need to be on a rope team when you're climbing a crevasse mountain so that you have further protection. Again, if you're climbing a volcano, you're going to uh, have an alpine start. You're going to start climbing in the middle of the night. We probably woke up around 2.30 or 3 and we're climbing well before 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this was probably, I still have memories of this. It's probably the, the, my most favorite time on the entire climb, more so than being at the summit. It, it was truly kind of a magical, spiritual moment for me. You're at about 13,000 feet. Daybreak has occurred a short time ago. You're looking down on this incredible view and realize that there are very few other people that are going to be able to see what you did because you've had the privilege of being able to climb up here. And you know, <clears throat> you're on this 30 or 35 degree slope. You're sitting there because you've basically hacked out a seat in the snow with your ice axe and you take a short break and you're just, uh, it's, it's hard to describe uh, what it means to be in a position like that, very privileged. I'm striking the, the uh, summit climber's pose. And again, here in the background, uh, that's Mount Adams. So the sort of the other side of the coin now. Uh, Mount Rainier's summit cone is gigantic. Uh, this is the crater rim that you can see here. These are other climbers that have just come onto the, the, the summit via a different route. It's, this is called the Disappointment Cleaver route um, via Camp Muir. Anyone who gets to the, the summit, the, the crater rim is considered to have summited Mount Rainier. I'm standing on Columbia Crest at this point, which is the, abs, the actual high point. Uh, and I got there because the Emmons Glacier route takes you directly to the, uh, the, the high point. These people here are probably deciding whether or not they feel good enough to have climbed and summited Mount Rainier officially or whether they want to get to the official high point on the mountain. This, this is the summit. You know that you're on Mount Rainier. That's a, it's an active volcano because there are heat vents with warm gases ex, uh, escaping all the time. You could spend, if you wanted to, a very pleasant night perfectly warm and comfortable on the summit uh, if you chose to put yourself close to one of these heat vents. So this is where you know that Mount Rainier is a live, active, living volcano. I mentioned the glissade chute uh, on the interglacier. And uh, yes, I had to show you another video. This was my most favorite glissade run. You go down the interglacier a long way. It's really a lot of fun. And it's a lot easier to go down than it is to come up. So uh, that was Mount Rainier. So now we've, those three mountains, St. Helens, Adams, and Rainier are in the state of Washington. Mount Hood, we've now crossed into Oregon, further down the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Mount Hood is the high point in the state of Oregon. By the numbers, it's over 11,000 feet tall. Relatively recent eruption history, you know, mid 19th century. The United States Geological Survey threat potential is very high. Uh, I climbed this back in uh, 2013. This is that threat assessment map by the US Geological Survey. So this is the area that would be affected by lava flow and pyroclastic flow. And then you can see a whole bunch of communities in the way of the Lahar events that would be triggered by pyroclastic flow, melting ice and snow. And it's pretty close to Portland as well. So Portland sits kind of surrounded by the volcanic arc. You have Mount St. Helens, 
uh, Mount Adams and uh, Mount Hood, all snow covered, all relatively close to the city. So the, uh, you do the calculation on uh, snow and ice on Mount Hood. Uh, you look at this, there's uh, a total of about 84 billion gallons of water that could be released if uh, Mount Hood generated an explosive pyroclastic event. So this is almost twice as much water as was released by the Mount St. Helens uh, uh, eruption. So uh, even though it's a lot less than the trillion gallons of water contained on Mount Rainier slopes, it would still be a significant event. And uh, Mount Hood is still very much uh, an active volcano. It is not, it is not ex an extinct volcano. These are the climbing routes on the, this side of Mount Hood. Mount Hood is a super popular climb. Uh, I did this as part of a guided climb. Uh, it's considered a, a technical climb. Uh, if you're being safe, you should be roped up and have technical climbing gear. Uh, I use this route, this green line, up to this area called the Hog's Back, to this feature called the Pearly Gates, where these narrow snow and ice chutes that lead you out onto the summit ridge. Um, you get an alpine start again. Uh, Mount Hood is has a very limited climbing season. It's considered uh, an unsafe mountain to climb, certainly in August and maybe when you get into late July, because as it begins, the snow and ice begins to melt out, uh, you end up with significant danger from rockfall coming down the mountain. So it's it's only considered truly safe to climb, you know, earlier in the year when the snow and the ice is still a lot firmer. So we're getting into a snowcat here to, to bring the climbers to the place where we'll actually start to climb. I talked my daughter Katie into doing this uh, back in 2013. We did this on Father's Day weekend. And so that was kind of my, uh, the way I convinced her to do it. Said, you know, you, you need to help me celebrate Father's Day. Uh, the reality was it didn't take very much to convince her to do this. Uh, so you can see we're further up the mountain here. Use your imagination. You can see some uh, uh, climbers behind us coming up the slope. Uh, this is an area called the Devil's Kitchen on Mount Hood. And this is where you know like Mount Rainier, that Mount Hood is an active, a living volcano. Uh, it's called the Devil's Kitchen because throughout this area, as you walk through it, you can smell hydrogen sulfide gas that's being leaked from the volcano. And there's no snow cover here because it's warm enough as a, uh, as a consequence of the emissions that the snow can't accumulate here on the mountain at this time of year. One of the objective hazards you deal with with a mountain would be, I mentioned rockfall, but also avalanche. You can see that this area, you need to be careful because under the wrong conditions, this is a, a snow chute that an avalanche coming down would be very destructive and dangerous for a climber. There's Katie getting ready to do the last part of the climb. This is the pearly gates, the exit chute to the summit ridge. And you can see it's a very narrow gap. Um, it's snow and ice. That's the guide that it's gone up to the top to secure the area for the clients. She's roped up, she's got her ice axe ready to go climbing. And then uh, there she is with uh, another climber. Uh, they are in a configuration that's called short roped. You normally don't do this if you're just climbing with friends, but with a guide, they have better control over clients that might not have a lot of experience with climbing. And so short roping climbers, uh, climbers together is considered much safer and gives the, uh, the guide a lot more control and it increases the safety margin. There's the, uh, the summit of uh, Mount Hood. And again, it's, you're in the ring of fire. There's more mountain, volcanic mountains in the, in the background. This is climbing on the way down. Now, I include this just sort of to indicate, you know, it, it gets pretty steep. Everyone here is on a rope team. About a month before Katie and I did this climb, a guy had gone up this mountain solo. 
without the right gear, slipped and fell 1,500 feet down this section of the mountain and died. And so, you know, it's it's perfectly safe mountain to climb. It's not a super technically difficult mountain to climb, but if you do stupid things, bad things can happen. Again, you know, old climbers, bold climbers, that kind of thing. But the final mountain I wanted to talk about, uh, we're now uh, further in Southern Oregon, the, the Three Sisters. So this is the South, the Middle and the North Sister. Uh, by the numbers, the South Sister is the tallest of the three, I believe it's about a little over 10,000 feet. Uh, not as active recently as some of the others. They estimate maybe the last time it erupted was 2000 years ago. Uh, it's still rated as a very high threat potential by the, uh, the US Geological Survey. And I climbed this back in 2016. Familiar map again from the USGS. This is the, 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 the lava and pyroclastic danger area. And these, the, these are the lahar paths that could happen if there was a pyroclastic and snow event. The closest metropolitan area is Bend, which has about 200,000 people. Um, much less snow and ice on the Three Sisters, probably a total of about 39 billion gallons of water if you include all three, the South, the Middle, and the North Sister. So uh, less total snow that, uh, that could be released as water compared to uh, Mount St. Helens. South Sister is a completely non-technical route. It's a, it's a complete walk up. Uh, when I did it, I was never on snow. I was on uh, scree or dirt the entire time. You can go up and down in one day. It's uh, six miles up and about 5,000 vertical feet of climbing. So it's a 12 mile trip, round trip. It's a long tiring day, but you can do it in a day. Uh, some people choose to do it in two days. They stop at the Marine Lake campground, which cuts off almost two miles from the climb, but I, I just did it in a day. I'm, I'm camping here at the, uh, the night before the climb. Biggest problem here was chipmunks. They terrorized me. Uh, I had heard about the fact that chipmunks were a problem here, and I couldn't even eat my dinner without them climbing into my pack when I turned my head for a minute. I finally gave up and packed my gear back in the car at the parking lot because I was afraid in the middle of the night they were going to have chewed a hole in the tent in my pack. They were just horrible little creatures. There's the start of the climb. You can see if you stopped at the lake, uh, that trail is about two miles from where you begin. Uh, there's the Moraine Lake uh, and the campground area off to the side. Uh, you can see at the time of the year I did it, there was very little snow cover left on uh, the South Sister. Uh, I'm approaching there the, the uh, crater rim. Uh, and there's a look from the crater. Uh, the thing that made the South Sister different for me is this, this area of Oregon is very different. I, it's almost, the scenery is almost otherworldly. I, I, I felt almost like I was you know, on the surface of another planet, I guess is the way to describe it. You know, maybe this is what it would be like to go mountain climbing on Mars. There, there's very less tree cover. It's very barren and arid territory, but, you know, really cool in its own way. The inside of the crater rim, much smaller area than Rainier. And that's a, that's a great view of the middle and the, the north sister from, from the south sister. So I, I, I got up to the rim. This is 10,000 feet high. There's nothing around. I mean, there are no trees, there are no bushes. I sit down to have a snack and this damn guy comes up to me and starts harassing me. And I'm thinking, what is he doing up here? I mean, there's nothing for him to eat except for the fact that the South Sister is a super popular climb. So he's up here on a regular basis looking for handouts. 
the the only thing that I could think was that I hope was this wasn't the same damn guy that had tried to get into my pack the night before. So that's the South sister. That's basically the end of my talk. Um, the Ring of Fire continues from the Cascades down through Central and South America. Uh, if you know, if you keep a scorecard on what country has the most volcanoes uh, in the Ring of Fire, Russia is number one, we're number two, and Japan is number three. That's all I had. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And well, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for having me, Laura.